Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Luke Armstrong, and I'm a designer here at Don't Panic Labs. And for starters, I want to, to uh, welcome you to Vogon Poetry. For those of you who don't know, Vogon Poetry is the second worst form of poetry in the galaxy. My poem has no rhyme, but it does have a little reason. Uh, it's a poem about slowing down to build on a greater understanding. It's a poem about uh, considering how pieces of the whole are connected. And it's called The Theory of Slow Design. The idea of slow design uh, started as part of the slow movement. Uh, basically, the slow movement is a statement against instant gratification. It insists upon calculating the full costs of your choice. And it begins with a comment about food. So the slow movement was born in Italy in the 1980s um, by a guy named Carlo Petrini and a group of activists who objected to the building of McDonald's uh, on the Spanish steps of Rome. They basically started with an observation. Fast food is a disaster for animals, the planet, and human health. They asked the question, how is this idea serving us, and is there a better alternative? Slow food places additional value on producing wholesome local food, offering fair prices and conditions to food producers who create our sustainable food systems, connecting family and friends by taking time to nurture our bodies with the food that we prepare. So this is what they would say we could do instead of fast food. The slow movement advocates for a cultural shift towards slowing down the pace of life with this extra time, we can deal with the complexities that exist in our day-to-day -day lives. Slow Design asks us to intentionally focus on a broader set of design impacts and outcomes. It's aspirational, and it helps us ask and answer bigger questions. For some uh, qualities a slow designer might be looking for, we can look at things like terms like holistic, sustainable, adaptable, durable, these sorts of things, right? They're about the long term. They're about tangential um, happenings. But you might be thinking, won't slow design take forever? And for the haters and the ever sprinters in the room, <laughs> Uh, it doesn't really work like that. Slow, down, slow design asks us to focus on time a different way. Slow doesn't really mean calendar time long or calendar time short. It means effective, intentionally planning activity that drives you in a direction that you choose. So you can put away your whips and just know that it's a different way of defining where you're headed. Slow design, as opposed to reactive design, places additional value on balancing the short and long-term impacts of design, creating positive synergies between the elements of a system, minimizing waste in terms of time, labor, energy, um, physical resources. It, it asks us to promote the well-being of individuals, uh, their society, and the environment in which they operate. It asks for time for research, contemplation, testing. <coughs> so in, in researching for this presentation, I came across a, a group called Slow Lab, or Slow Research Lab. They're a multi multidisciplinary group um, out of New York and the Netherlands. And they seek to use a mix of theoretical reflection and creative experimentation <coughs> uh, to take on big design problems. 
For them, the word slow is intended not only to inspire a different velocity of engagement, but to also evoke a quality of being, a characteristic, uh, characteristic or characterized by critical thinking, deep spaces of reflection, and the unique forms of creative expression that are born of them. They use slow both as an adjective and an active verb that describes the pursuit of more holistic ways of knowing oneself, encountering others, sharing knowledge, and evolving together towards harmonious and resilient forms of living. So that's the, the kind of level of aspiration we're talking about here. I'm gonna go through kind of their core principle set and then we'll kind of deviate and get to some examples. Reveal is the beginning principle for them. It really gets to what factors are hidden from the view of those currently solving this problem. What is not being considered? Expand. What are the possibilities that exist that we have not yet considered? What goes beyond the edges of our box, our perspective? Reflect. What can we learn from evaluating and contemplating <coughs> after each experience? They call this uh, reflective consumption, which I like. Engage. How can we create and use community knowledge to speed up the rate of innovation? Things like open source, collaboration. Participate, how can we open up design opportunities, creating feedback loops and active participation with subject <coughs> experts and user communities? Evolve, what will we need in the future? How, are, how will our systems adapt to this changing landscape? These principles are not set in concrete. They're adaptable for many situations. These are not the only principles. They're not carved into any stones. It's more like an, a way of, of designing a way of being. So now I'd like to uh, shift gears a little bit away from Slow Lab's ideas, although I think they'll still remain relevant. Um, and I'd like to talk about some of my past experiences and processes for slow design. And just as a quick war warning, I'm not going to talk about Don't Panic Labs much in this part. Um, part of that is because we have com confidentiality agreements and things, and so I can't use some of those examples. Um, but these principles are right here, too. For me, slow design is an additive process. You have some starting place, and then it sort of works organically like an improv comedian. Yes, and this, and this. Um, it's kind of also like music in that it has periods of activity and periods of rest. We take a small design step forward, and then we observe, and then we move on. The explorer's loop is how I describe my process for slow design. The Explorer's Loop is a process for iteratively designing systems with two <coughs> continuously rotating cycles of making and reflecting. The reflecting part is similar to Slow Lab's concept of reflective consumption. You start by uh, imagining uh, a better path into the future from where you are. How could this be better? From there, you move to defining what details you could add to bring the solutions into focus. In the design phase, you describe how it should work, how it could work, how it does work, um, building clarity for the most important parts first. Then, of course, you have to build it, you have to do it, you have to put in all the finger-breaking work that, uh, that goes into a project. Uh, then you got to use it. Um, put yourself in the actual flow, understand the process, the underlying needs. You have to notice 
while you're using it and afterwards, what points of friction exist? How can I measure those points of friction? What is possible? We take that and we clarify, what can I make of the data and opinions before me? What kinds of conclusions can I draw? Then we take and prioritize those things in rank order. What problems are we trying to solve now? Which ones are most <laughs> critical for us here? Now we just got to focus. So how about an example? I like challenges and big questions. <coughs> so I thought I'd organize them a little bit like that. So here, I have a big question that was on my mind that the Explorer's Loop sort of helped me address. Can we communicate more effectively by <coughs> cooperating more? <coughs> In 2010, I started a design company called Redmind. At this stage, I'd call it like a late stage experimental product, um, experimental services kind of company. Um, the idea was marketing services built on efficient software to create more efficient communication systems. Uh, the idea came from previous communication and design experimentation curiosity, some education, um, and some uh, business experiments uh, creates um, some employment opportunities. I worked for a franchisor um, and some startup uh, initiatives that I got to be a part of. Slow design can look like stepping stones that enable you to gain access to new and unexpected opportunities. So at each step, we gain new understanding. And based upon those understandings, we may change our objectives. This is kind of a timeline of how I move through the process to get to Randmine. When I first landed in Omaha in 2004, I started a freelance practice that I called Creates. Not the best name, it was okay. Uh, we designed for print and web, like, we, we worked mostly with small businesses and a couple small agencies. But I taught, I, that experience taught me a great deal about time boxing, time management. Um, it gave me my first exposure to things like Google AdWords when I launched a $99 logo, a $149 identity package. Um, and also taught me about digital products because I built a website template archive uh, that I sold online and on CD and DVD, uh, which I didn't do a lot of sales, but it was interesting. From there, uh, I took a job at National Property Inspections to kind of support my freelancing career. I didn't have enough business to have that be my full-time day job. And uh, National Property Inspections is a small international franchisor. So while I was there, I learned a ton about uh, local web marketing, SEO, SEM. Um, franchise concepts taught me about leveraging data, templating. Um, it was my first taste of enterprise web management. So we had <coughs> 300 websites to support. When I got there, they were all managed uh, using uh, front page, uh, which was awful. Um, and we built a kind of new web platform to support all that stuff on Diamond Nuke. Uh, I got to design software mockups for kind of a new email templating <coughs> engine. Um, I got to code and even help manage the system administration for the system. Um, enterprise AdWords campaigns, and even they even let me operate as an entrepreneur in residence for a startup <coughs> called Franchise Loop, which was uh, meant to capture leads. Uh, From there, uh, basically, we ceased operating our startup. And from there, I got kind of antsy and I wanted to do more entrepreneurship. So I left to start Redmine. And it began with, it began with some simple questions. Um, what can we do to be more efficient and create recurring billing opportunities? So I left 
national property inspections with a contract, so I knew I had some basis. So the rest was, how do I create additional recurring revenues that I can sort of lean on and predict? So I was running servers, charging <coughs> monthly fees for that. We built our own content management systems and we charged for that. We built a base of recurring revenue around uh, email marketing platforms, that we, uh, the first one we bought. And then we started building, and cus uh, building custom web apps and partnering with businesses to do their corporate innovation. In 2015, we had the opportunity to uh, focus on our core platform. We call that, I, I mean, we might call that evolving, right? Um, so we, we started to build out our team around our core platform. The idea was simple, it was software plus service, and um, we ultimately did succeed in building the platform, in getting positive metrics, and finding some great partners. Uh, but in the end, uh, we did not grow our partner network fast enough uh, to continue to grow our customer base. Uh, we were very heavily reliant on a few big companies, and uh, we fell over. Um, the unexpected side effects of such things, though, are that I got the opportunity to work here and to talk to all of you today. Um, and the next, like, the next steps in slow design are always sort of unknown. So from here, we're at a rest. We could find new community partners to relaunch this vision. <coughs> we could publish demos for each of our offerings to try to sell off our products that we already built. We could reinvent our company. We could open source all of our catalog. And we could shut it down which I think in slow design, it's worth pausing here to say that this is the hardest part. Because in slow design, there really isn't a point where you necessarily give up. It's all about learning stuff, doing stuff, so how do you know when it's over? I'm gonna use that as a space to transition to my next big question, which is, can we grow cultural capital in a community. We're going to get a little more concrete and talk about Cali Commons, which I started in 2013 with my partner Molly. Um, Cali Commons is a former corner market uh, at the corner of 40th California Streets in Omaha. We started building out our vision um, crewing to look at the space, we rented out offices, and at night and weekends we hosted gallery shows and events for our friends and community partners at this Cali Common space. But it really starts way, way before that. So we're going to do a little backtracking. We took many exploratory steps before Cali Commons could become a community space that supports connecting and activating local creative talent. Uh, I went to school for art, for business, for design. And what I learned in that time is that nobody knew how to put those things together at all. <clears throat> when I moved to Omaha, not, not too long after, I met Molly, and we started doing performance paintings together. Uh, we found a connection to each other through this uh, collaborative painting. And um, we've been sharing these visual conversations with others in the community, but there aren't a lot of venues that are really suitable for this. Uh, there's a lot of places for music, there's a lot of places for art, there's not a lot of places for sort of weird in-between stuff. So where could we run our test shop? How could we get out of our basement? We started in the neighborhood of Benson in Omaha. And we played with bands, and we auctioned off work with uh, um, a text messaging app that we built that let people buy paintings in real time. <clears throat> but when I started designing out of the studio space, it didn't quite fit my needs. We started looking for a bigger space, a more permanent space, which led us to Cali Commons. Um, and we asked ourselves, how could we create a space that worked for us and others? 
we created a grand vision that incorporated ideas from digital and physical spaces. Could we create a self-replicating model for a local creative creativity incubator? Could it allow communities to grow their cultural footprint by supporting their unique community talents? The idea was pretty simple. Let's give creative folks resources that are both physical and digital so that they can express themselves and then amplify those expressions to their broader community who can then choose to support them uh, once they know that they exist. In 2019, we started working on a collaborative community, one that would set its own rules and vision for the future. We started a design group to steer this vision called Design Commons. What's next for this project? Well, actually, it's ongoing right now. So we have a meeting later tonight where we're defining our governance structure, and we're getting ready to launch our seventh season at Cali Commons. This time, hopefully, with an underlying community that's built underneath of us that has basically helped us design all the principles around how and why we operate the way we do. We're trying to become a true community-run cooperative that is completely financially <coughs> stable. And even goes beyond that to self-replicate and self-heal the organization. Got one more big question, and this one's gonna be as much on the theory side as I can get. How can we use time more effectively? How can we make time feel better? How can we gain a sense of control over our time? If you happen to come to my last book on poetry, you know I like to fool with the rules a little bit. An extension of the idea of life hacking for me is something I've been calling elastic life. <coughs> elastic life is the idea that flexibility and autonomy create more enjoyable experiences of life. What are the constituent parts that make up this elastic life? My pondering began with the idea of elastic time. Elastic time is sort of like, what if time operated around cycles of light and dark, like it used to before we had clocks? Would we feel more connected with the natural cycles that we experience in life if we had a more direct form of time? From there, I moved on to Elastic Calendar. Could we create flexible calendar increments for different sized weeks and months? Could we create elastic schedules that created flexible daily rituals that are adaptable <coughs> based upon certain segments of time? And finally, Elastic Focus, how can we better achieve meaningful goals within a flexible system? From the early exper experiments of life hacking and of general fascination with time, I built out some prototypes and design documents to explain my thoughts. The influences are extremely broad, including things like meditation, yoga, just general reflections, marketplace ideas like agile and lean and slow, uh, user-centered design, design thinking. Um, and I, I really strive to answer the question of how I could build elasticity into my life in terms of managing expectations and directing my effort more effectively. You kind of become like a stacking uh, group of blocks, right? So we have elastic time, which lets us align our life with light. We have elastic calendar, which lets us uh, change the length of work and rest cycles. We have elastic schedule that lets us handle our recurring effort. And we have elastic focus that helps us handle our direction and impact. If we can better control the events that flow through our sense of time, we can build a more responsive and comfortable experience of life. So we're gonna focus here on elastic focus. Uh, and how we might control 
the direction and intensity of our focus. Just because you can only put effort in one direction at a time doesn't mean you can't apply effort in many directions across a day, a week, or a month. <coughs> Don't be fooled. This is not multitasking. It's planning and execution of your agenda. It works like a professional project manager would manage building software. It's prioritizing your vision, your needs, your wants, and aligning them uh, with your effort to achieve them little bits at a time. And if the vision changes before you arrive, it's because you're refining it based upon new information that you've gained. I'm showing you the simplest version of Elastic Focus that I could come up with. Um, in this case, I'm using Don't Panic Labs as an example. Um, and we're moving through five different time-based perspectives. Um, as always, these processes are adaptable. Um, they're an experimentation in progress. So you can imagine that this is just one of my many different focuses. In this example, I'm imagining how I might grow my relevance here at Don't Panic Labs, and in turn, the relevance of Don't Panic Labs design department. We're going to start with the most distant lens first, that's impact. And for me, impact is like a decade-like time lens, right? It's five, ten years from now. What, what am I hoping that will happen uh, if I put in a little bit of effort for ten years? Where am I going? What's this going to do? What's it going to mean? So in this case, I've said, uh, I'd like to be regionally known as a valuable system designer and visionary thinker. Well, how would, how would I go about achieving that? Then brings us to the next time lens, which is outcomes. And for me, this is roughly year. Um, and it has more details in it. It needs to be achievable and measurable. So in this case, I've said, I would like to establish a personal professional best of two Vogon poetries and six blog posts this year. If I do those things, I'll be moving myself in the direction of the impact which I choose to make. From there, we can move down the time perspective even further and say <coughs> we're at a milestone-like uh, <coughs> stage. And at this stage, it should be something that I can get done in a month or two or three. So I have stuff listed like a uh, complete January post on uh, meeting stakeholders where they are. And complete Vogon poetry presentation talk on slow design. Here we are. But it can get smaller than that too. We've got stories, which is what could I get done next week? And we've got actions, which is what could I get done tomorrow? And by the time you break things down like that, you're pointing incremental effort in a direction of your choosing and you're reevaluating those things on a regular basis. And you're able to juggle more than one focus because you're able to put it down and know what you're still trying to achieve. So what's the next step for elastic focus and elastic life? To me, it's listening, sharing these prototypes, gathering feedbacks, and experimenting more. It's trying to identify a marketplace for this idea. Uh, that might be interested in helping uh, to develop better impacts and impact-driven metrics, um, and also maybe improve the humanity of, uh, of management systems, right? But I don't really know. That's the beauty of it. It's exploration. It's experimentation. Using Elastic Focus, I hope to build the amount of awareness that I'm placing underneath the most important activities in my life. If I had a mantra, it might be slow down, be curious, explore, listen, look, notice and discover, grow the value, not the quantity of your work, get more done with less effort, find balance, and choose to live and work slow. Thanks. Uh, if you'd like to talk more about slow design, 
or anything else design, uh, you can reach out to me at Don't Panic Labs. Uh, my email is larmstrong at don'tpaniclabs.com. Thanks. Oh, and uh, I'll take some questions if anybody has any, but I also have some related and comparable ideas that I listed out ahead of time if anybody's interested. So let's leave that up for now. Molly has a question. Uh, so how do you think things would be different for you if you did not subscribe to slow design? Like if you use the fast food version of design, where would Redmine and Cali Commons and Elastic like be now? Um, that's a good question. I don't think they would exist. I think um, I think I would have kept my ideas more surface, and I think I probably would have subscribed to um, other systems. And when I reached the limits of those systems, I probably would have just opted to find a new system. So I think, for me, it's <coughs> it's just behind all the things that I do all the time, there's a need to learn, there's a need to um, sort of get information in the most direct way possible, which is from experience. We got Doug. So I'm just kind of curious for you personally, I feel like I know you pretty well, I've kind of know you pretty well in the last couple of years. And I know you have a lot of different kind of areas of interest. And I, I'm kind of curious how you did, which could take an enormous amount of your focus <coughs> to pursue those things. And, and for me, I, I see those things as these, I, I have a, a similar problem. There's a lot of different areas where I can spend my time and spend my focus. So I'm, I'm kind of curious how you decide where does where which one of which of those things are the highest priority for you, and do you get do you start down a path there and feel torn that you should be spending more time on maybe maybe one of these other areas that you you should have focus. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, uh, first off, yes, I do feel that same kind of pressure. Uh, I would guess that that's why. I've gone to this uh, extreme to sort of describe these ideas in this way. Um, I, I think the best way to get at this is just to kind of describe the process uh, that I use right now, because it's the best I have, um, which is I try to capture all the ideas that I have um, that I feel like are relevant, um, meaning uh, I have like an extra, I'm sure other people do this too, but I have an extra kind of like asterisks on the word idea. Like idea needs to be like applicable for it to be valuable. Like it has to have some relevance, it has to have some ability to be achievable or um, work within the system, right? Uh, and if I have something like that where I feel like it's really aligning to something in my life, I always write it down. So uh, Evernote, my Evernote is filled with stuff and half of it is crap. And uh, of the rest of the half about Half of that is just work notes. And then the other stuff is just stuff I don't know what to do with yet, but it is valuable. And I think a lot of times the focus has come out of a combination of those things and then stuff that I bump into in my real life, you know? So I'll talk to Doug about something and that will remind me of a thing. And then I'll go look at that thing and I'll think, eh, you know, that was kind of close, but I, now I kind of want to do this with it. And so it sort of just starts that evolving process. And I think the more attention that an idea has, the, like, the more it will grow automatically. And so uh, by just ha letting other people sort of like pique my interest and refocus me on something, I think that says that this focus needs more time and energy. And so uh, by surfacing those things in a, in a practical sense with the elastic focus, <coughs> I'm able to hopefully look across a great deal of concepts that are partially started and then leave them in states 
that I know I can still advance when my interest comes back. And I think some of that might also come from, um, I think his name is David Allen, and the, the Get Things Done, GTD. Uh, like one of the early versions of that, there was like a list building technique where you write everything down, and then you start at the top and you go through the list, and the first one that you feel motivated to work on, you do. You don't have to work on it for any certain amount of time. Uh, but then when you're done, you cross it off and you add it to the bottom of the list. And I really liked that idea of sort of cycling through things repeatedly and letting your motivation tell you what thing is the right thing to work on now. Um, because I think if you're trying to get into flow state, if you're trying to uh, do your best work, it's it's good to not ignore your own motivational instincts. Sorry, that was kind of long and rambly. Trying to figure out how I want to word this question. Um, so it seems like most of your experience with this is like very personal, and you've had a lot of experience sort of running your own businesses and doing your own things. And now you're in this organization, don't panic labs. So I'm kind of wondering, how do you, have you found any like particular friction points of having this system within somebody else's system, I guess? You know, if, you, if you're really reining your focus like you say you are, you almost necessarily are gonna have things that you don't focus on, and if that doesn't align with your manager or your organization, I, I just imagine you're gonna run into friction at some point. So can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so I think um, there are sort of limitations that we operate within all the time. And so uh, work can provide those sorts of limitations sometimes. But I think in this case, um, a lot of the things that we practice are, uh, they're not in opposition to these ideas. So. Uh, while I may not get to go as deep as I want to or solve particular problems maybe in, uh, at the human level that I would like to, I'm still able to expand uh, the view that I'm looking at a particular project. Um, <coughs> and basically say, um, you know, these things are given, these things are concrete, uh, but there are these other factors that are not being considered that are still within uh, our scope. And so I can consider those things. So I think applying them on your own in your personal space, you might have less limitations. But I don't think, uh, even in your own life, you'll have limitations. So I don't think it really changes anything. It's just different limits. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I think it does. I, I guess. You know, you probably have a lot of external constraints coming in from businesses, you know, like timelines and directors and things like that, and you just, you take those as they come, but you still use your own internal process to, I guess, better quantify what impact they have. So it, it makes the design better even with the constraint because you know sort of more explicitly what you're trading off, and you can share that. I guess, how, how much do you have to, like, educate people as to what you're doing? to kind of get them to buy into your thought process or does that just kind of come naturally and it isn't really grading at all? Well, to be honest, this is like my first time trying to explain this <laughs> idea uh, because I think generally I just try to provide the perspective and generally speaking, I've found that people enjoy that, right? So um, you might say like, oh, I like how, you think or how you're thinking about this problem. Um, and so for me, that's just the natural thing that I've trained myself to do, to sort of take away the barriers that I don't think are necessary. Um, and sometimes people will correct you and bring you back into alignment and say like, no, that's not a chess piece that's on the table right now. Like, uh, and that's okay. Uh, it's just that you learned about a limitation. And you, but you might even try it again at that later, you know, like uh, there's a lot of interpersonal things that happen. So, you might find out that the objection to that chess piece is different than what you thought it was. And maybe you can put it back on the table if you address the real objection instead. So there's, there's ways around stuff like that sometimes if you really find that it is an impediment to the project. Thank you. Yes. 
So my question is the, the flip side of this. Have you ever been in a situation where you go in through the process, missed your opportunity? <coughs> like, hey, I want to take an idea. How will you describe that? And I want to start putting it through it. And then by the time you have to look at it, you execute to do something with it. And the, the train has to like, Is that a thing? Okay, uh, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. So, because of taking the time to, to think through the uh, idea, opportunity, whatever it is, the fact that you take your time to think through it, by the time you're ready to take an actual item, act, make it, do something with it, the opportunity is gone. So, yeah. so like a, a window of opportunity. Yes, yes, missing a window of opportunity. Um, of course that happens, and it happens uh, in all things all the time. Um, there are always opportunities, and many of them are invisible to us. And so I guess I would say um, I can't think of any concrete examples where I've had a one-time open window that closed on me while I was considering it, uh, and that I didn't. I, it ended up being later that I really wanted that open window. Because I've had it happen before, but a lot of times it's just sort of like, well, one possibility is gone, but there's still all these other ones. And so you just move towards all the other ones, and that's a kind of an automatic self-selecting thing that happened, right? The window closed. <coughs> Not going to get my application in on time, so I didn't get accepted for tech stars, right? Like, oh, crap. I, something great could have happened from that, but I could also join my... Uh, local, uh, you know, startup collaborative or in motion, and maybe something great would happen there. And maybe I would have spent that time applying for the application and not gotten in. Like, I mean, there's always like, it's so complicated to to kind of question and second guess things. Um, but I think you know, adopting a system that asks you to be aware and notice um, probably doesn't let you down a great deal. Thank you all for coming and asking such great questions.